Hi everyone. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, today uh, we will discuss about uh, product security, operational technology, and industrial equipment. And yeah, the speaker is from the Finland, and he is currently working as the head of uh, products and application security. And yeah, the company name is Conrad Crane. Uh, welcome to uh, speaker Biset. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, uh, uh, first of all, thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to to speak on this topic that is very close to my heart. And uh, so today, uh, what I'm going to talk about is uh, let me share my screen first. If, I think now, now my screen should be visible. Yeah. Okay. Uh, before your presentation, yeah, uh, from the audience, yeah, if you want to ask question, yeah, you can mm -hmm. ask from the menti.com. Uh, we provided the code. Okay. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. We provided the code. The number is seven six two eight nine four six five. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, so I'm Basit Sayed. I'm working as head of product and application security for Kony Cranes Finland. Uh, just a bit about, about my background. So I have more than about 20 years of experience working in uh, cybersecurity, in telecommunications and uh, cloud development. And also uh, I have uh, quite extensive experience on the entrepreneur side and, and on the business side as well. And uh, the topic that I'm going to discuss today is really close to my heart. Uh, uh, first of all, I, I am uh, I'm a product security leader. And then uh, specifically, I'm not only working on the uh, IT or the cloud side of the things, but also heavily on the operational technology side of the things. So today, uh, what we are going to discuss is that what is operational technology and then how cybersecurity comes into the picture when we think about the systems that are uh, not, not as agile as uh, cloud or IT or our database systems. Okay, so just a quick glance on the content of today's presentation. Uh, first of all, uh, we are going to look into the, uh, uh, what is the main difference between the IT and the OT? And then we are going to discuss uh, a little bit about what are the different domains of the cybersecurity in general. And then I will delve more into the product security side of the things that what is product security, why does it matter, what does it contain? And after that, we will jump into a very important topic these days about the regulations and standards that what different regulations and standards apply to the operational uh, uh, OT side of cybersecurity uh, in our current context of time. And then I will uh, uh, deep dive into IEC 62443. And IEC 62443 is the, the, the main standard for cybersecurity for the operational technology. And then uh, we will end up our discussion uh, on some challenges that are really specific to the OT side of the things and that, are we, that we don't see on, uh, for example, when you're working with the data or the cloud or the normal computer systems. And then last but not the least, we will discuss some of the uh, cybersecurity uh, prominent incidents that have occurred in the last five to 10 years. Okay, so, so let me start with what is the main difference between the IT and the OT, OT side of the things. So when I think about IT, we will think about uh, uh, data and cloud and uh, uh, networks, internet, and uh, for example, uh, mobile devices, laptops, firewalls, and then uh, thinking about from the application side of the things like uh, the application, application that are running not only on our enterprise network servers, for example, SAP systems, ERP, CRM systems, um, but also, for example, our uh, mobile si side of the things as well. And uh, so if you think about from, from the IT perspective, the things are a uh, 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 lot more 
more automated the tools are a lot more mature and the things uh, are in uh, quite uh, you can say a mature stage at, at the moment but if you think about the ot side of the thing so when i think about the operational technology it's about the industry it's about the uh, the machines that are working for example in the factories for example like in uh, power plants or steel mills or, or or car manufacturing or even food processing for example so all of these environments and machinery basically qualify on on the OT side of the things. Then, uh, if you think very specific about the OT, so 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 we have the embedded systems, then we have the PLCs that are controlling the uh, the, the machinery, and then uh, uh, then then we have the SCADA architecture that 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 builds and uh, holds everything together in 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 in, in a single place. So, if I think about uh, uh, kind of a one-liner is that okay? What is the difference between the IT and OT? So then we can say that IT uh, is is about the information, as, as the name signifies. But OT is about how the things physically work in the real world. So and and then if you think more about then then IT is more about ones and zeros of information. But then OT is about the nuts and bolts of of the of of the operation. So 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 if you think about in, in a way is that then uh, so there can be a lot of overlap between IT and OT. And if you think about from the cybersecurity perspective, uh, what uh, is happening now is that that with the advent of, for example, Industry 4.0, and now, for example, machine learning, and now the further advent of the artificial intelligence and then, uh, and then uh, industrial IoT, Internet of Things. So previously what was happening is that, that these manufacturing plants or the OT environments, they were in silos. And even... Uh, only a selected group of individuals usually have access to them, like the contractors or the workers that are working there or the experts. But now, uh, with, with this uh, more digitalization coming and this more uh, evolution of the uh, how those machines are now connected with, for example, even to the internet or with the other networks. So now the uh, the threat uh, surface has really increased. So this means that. Uh, not only uh, from the uh, efficiency point of view or uh, productive productivity point of view, all of our industrial systems have uh, seen a huge growth. But then uh, on the other side of the table, the kind of the cyber threats and the cyber attacks that we have not started to see have become more sophisticated, more complicated. They become more. They become. They have become faster. So. So there is this cat and mouse game that is always going on, and now it has taken a kind of new uh, uh, shape uh, going 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 forward. So this means that, uh, uh, like, if if I think about like ten years ago from 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 now, so the the emphasis on the OT cybersecurity has really increased. And then if you think about, for example, like even if you look at the screen, for example, like the ports. So any uh, ports are kind of the basic backbone of any economy or a country where most of the goods are being created and transported. So imagine that if uh, if 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 the seaport or the main port of a country gets gets attacked by the by the cyber criminal, so it has the potential to actually sabotage the the trade of the whole country. So this means it it has become really important now to to put more emphasis on the OT cybersecurity going forward. Okay, and then one really basic difference between IT and OT is that uh, uh, the people who are familiar with cybersecurity uh, know about the CIA, which is this confidentiality and availab uh, availability and integrity. But then from the OT side of the things, the things are reversed basically. So, so, so on the IT side of the thing, we are more interested in uh, uh, having the protection of our data basically but from the ot side of the things we are more interested in that that our machines and our our, our system keeps on working so they are more available so this is a fundamental shift of thinking when you think about it security and the ot cyber security so in it we I, we need to think first about the confidentiality and then other things but on the ot side of the things we need to first think about the availability of the thing so that the so that the factory keeps on running the ports keep on transporting the goods and the power plants keep on producing for example energy that is the main thing uh from the ot ot perspective okay then let's think about the cyber security as a whole 
that uh, when this, the word cybersecurity comes into the mind, so it, it's, it's, a, it's a very overarching term, an umbrella term, and there are many different domains within the cybersecurity. And, and then the other thing is that it, it depends upon how you are actually slicing this whole uh, field. But here, I, what I try to do, have tried to do, is that I have put down four to five main domains of the cybersecurity that, uh, that that we see in today's world. So the most famous, when we think about cybersecurity, comes in information security. So information security is basically about the data, about IT systems, about, for example, like how we are uh, protecting our data. Is it confidential and the privacy aspects of it? And then we have this product security. So product security means that uh, whatever we are producing uh, or uh, or whatever the products are being shipped or delivered or uh, commissioned so they are secure so this means that from product security point of view we are covering the whole life cycle of the product right from the beginning the idea the architecture till we deliver the product and also during the uh, uh, operations and maintenance of of the product so each phase has its own requirements of security and that is covered from the in, in, in the product security and then we have the application security so the difference between the product and application security is that the product security means that we are uh, integrating cyber security into the development of the product but application security means that we already have for example bought the applications for example some tools from some vendors or we, we are using some open source tools for example and we are running it on our servers or using it for some other purpose so then how should we make sure that those tools are secure they are not compromised or the data that those tools are using are is 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 is, is still confidential and it's not leaked there is no data breaches or, or security incidents so that comes into the application security part so application security means that we already have an application or or, or, a, or a piece of software that is running and we make sure that its whole operation is secure and then we have ot security uh, which means that uh, uh, anything that is related to uh, to the industrial side of the things i mean this is a very kind of simplified version of definition but this is how you can understand and ot security is more towards the industrial security side of the things and then we have the network security uh, uh, and this can apply on in in both perspective on the it side as, as well as well as the ot side as well so so it could include for example network segmentation uh, 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 deciding on what kind of firewalls should be used, for example, unidirectional firewalls should be used, for example, for OT systems, and uh, and these kind of similar topics. So they are being covered by the network security topics. These are the kind of major four or five domains that that I think cover major part of the cybersecurity landscape. There can be other as well, but I I I I I have just restricted restricted myself to these five here. Okay, and then uh, th th thinking about again, uh, em emphasizing on this uh, uh, OT security side of the things that uh, as we are progressing and digitalizing more and more, the the, the types of threats have uh, have started really evolve basically. So this means that uh, not only we should think about that how our industrial systems or any kind of tools that are using in, in, in that uh, or any kind of technologies that we're using in, in that context are not only secure uh, during the operations part of it, but then when we are actually uh, developing those tools and testing those tools, we already think about how the hackers are thinking, what are kind of the malicious actors uh, that can target our system when they are in operation. So this means that the uh, importance of product security is, is 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 has become significantly high that it should be taken into account in each and every development process yeah so what about product security so it's about safeguarding uh, safeguarding our products against those uh, cyber threats and then as i said it should just start really from the outset it should start really from the beginning of, of the cycle and then in today's context, it's not an afterthought, but it's kind of a mandatory part of the development process or an essential part of the development process. And uh, that's why we have already started to see uh, 
many regulations that I will discuss uh, uh, in more detail a bit later, that they have now started to include specific clauses or a specific chapters on uh, on the requirements of the cybersecurity inside them, and which shows that that, that this this has started to take really a good traction on all the levels. So when I think about product security in general, it it means uh, uh, our product development lifecycle is secure. That we are doing security testing, and if there are any applications that we are integrating into our product, uh, if how, for example, the, the, the their APIs are secure, and then uh, they are, for example, like uh, they are properly updated, there are no vulnerability, vulnerabilities in it, and then we already think about that when our product goes into the operations and the maintenance part, then how are we going to actually tackle the security issues there as well? Then there is more to product security. So here I have, I, I, I can speak on product security for hours and hours, but then here are the uh, some uh, flagship uh, things that we consider when we start talking about product security. So uh, thinking about uh, uh, so thinking th thinking about first of all, uh, as I mentioned, that security should be taken right from the outset. So right from the design phase or the architecture phase, we should already start thinking about these um, secure design practices and also verifying architecture for the secure security practices. That is everything fine from the security point of view. And then a uh, very important is secure configuration. So it's more about, for example, like if you have a phone or a device, then you just factory set it. So 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 there is always an op op option that you can just restore to the default settings. So then we should make sure that those default settings are also uh, fine from the security point of view. So we should have a secure default configuration for each device. Then very important part is, is the secure communication, which means that if I'm developing a product and it has different components, not only the communication between those components is secure, but when I'm integrating uh, many systems, many uh, uh, products into make a larger system, so their communication is secure as well. There is no possibility of this man in the middle attack and, and, kind, and, and similar threats there. Uh, a very important part, part is the vulnerability management. Uh, so, uh, any product, software product that you, that, that we develop, uh, there are always, for example, let's take the example of this open source or third party component. So there are always those third party components there, for example. So, and those third party components are publicly available. And then if you look at the CVSS scores and, and, and those public databases, vulnerability databases, so there are on, almost on the daily basis that new issues are being discovered in those components. And what usually happen is that the, the supplier of that uh, software component uh, issues a new up, updated version, which is uh, which fixes that security vulnerability. So this means that we need to actually keep an eye on our, uh, uh, on our product bill of materials or the list of components that we have. And uh, as soon as we find that there, there's a compromise in any of the uh, components inside our product, so we should actually issue those patching and upgrades and updates. That's why we are actually, uh, for example, like on Android, you we, we are receiving those updates quite uh, frequently and the same case should be also for the ot systems as well and then this cannot happen unless we have proper logging and monitoring and auditing and also from the security point of view and then very important part is the access control so for example who can actually uh, sign into our system who can actually authenticate and then once the authentication is done what features that person or or or, or uh, user can use on, on my product or on my system. So basically authorization as well. So the authentication and authorization are, are really the keystones of uh, product security here. And uh, and then very important part is, is this training and awareness. So as I just mentioned that, if you think about OD security or the product security, there are many different stages in the life cycle. And even during the operations, there, there can be many different kind of roles that are needed, many different kind of persons that are needed to in, in order to properly operate the whole, for example, factory or the power plant or even a smaller system. So then each person has a different 
requirement for uh, being uh, uh, aware from the security point of view, as well as there could be some very specific train security trainings that that role or person needs. So this, so 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 then there should there is a need to have uh, general cybersecurity training and awareness program to cover the general 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 cyber hygiene, but then there should be uh, specific training programs or smaller courses that can be taken by some very specific persons within this whole uh, supply chain or, or, or the life cycle chain. Yeah. And then a very uh, uh, sh short touchdown on the business side of the things. So why product security is important. So it gives you definitely a competitive edge on your uh, competitors. And then if the products are designed in a secure way, so then the threat surface area is already reduced. This means that the probability of getting a cyber attack is less. And even if you get attacked, then the damage control is easy and the mitigations are already there that will contain the damage already. And then it, it leads to improved customer experience, definitely cost saving because the earlier you, earlier you fix the issue, the cheaper it is uh, for, 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 for the company. And the, so there is this kind of a shift left, left approach for us that we are doing things as early as possible, detecting the issues as early as possible and fixing them before they become a major problem. This means that we need less maintenance for our products. It, it leads to a better reputation and then it also helps us to comply with different standards. And definitely any kind of data that is involved in the operation, whether it's a personal information uh, information covered by, for example, GDPR or it's machine data, uh, there, it, it's privacy and confidentiality and security will, will be taken care of automatically during the design phase. Okay, then, uh, a very important topic uh, these days is are these standards and regulations. So there is a huge tsunami of uh, uh, regulation uh, that that is being introduced by European Union now, and some of those regulations are already in place. The other ones will be in place during this year and in the in, in the coming years. So this means that the uh, not only the manufacturers of the industrial equipment, but also the the uh, the entities that are actually running those factories or power plants, they all have to comply with this new set of standards. And some of these uh, regulations are specifically for cybersecurity. The other ones are general in nature, but they have the sections of cybersecurity inside it. And uh, so I will just go through a few of them here and also some standards that are relevant to uh, OT side of the things when we think about the cybersecurity. So first of all is this NIST, NIST 2 directive. So NIST 2 directive uh, is basically deals with the, on the organization level. So basically you can say that uh, the company A is secure according to the NIST 2, or, or you can say that company A is has compliance for NIST 2. But then you cannot say that, okay, this specific product that company is creating is, is secure, but then it's more like on the organization level. So it, it includes security on a very on a very uh, wider scale, for example, also thinking about the, how the HR processes should be, should be handled and how different controls should be handled, basically. Then we have the Cyber Resilience Act, and this is one of the most uh, uh, impactful piece of regulations for uh, anything that is so being sold in EU and that has a digital element. So it covers anything that you, if you, even if you're selling a, a box or even you're selling a whole power plant or a crane, big crane or a port. So it applies to all of them as long as they have some kind of digital element element in, in it. So it, it, it has many different uh, requirements. And the, if you could think about some of the key things that it, it says, that it says that uh, each product should have this uh, security assessments going on. Then we should be following up all on the vulnerabilities and not only uh, managing them, but also providing the up upgrades and patches to a certain uh, for a certain period of time that is defined in the in the in the regulation text. And then. Uh, we should have the incident response capabilities, which means that if, if a cybersecurity incident happens to that 
related to that product, then that uh, the manufacturer or the, op the the company who is actually operating that that, that uh, product should have the capability actually to handle that incident. And then uh, there is an archiving requirement, which means that the technical documentation and other documentation should be uh, uh, archived or saved for at least, I think, 10 years. And uh, I think it was at least, at least 10 years. But the, ten the thing is that uh, Cyber Resilience Act or CRA actually defines different categories of the product. So if you are in the kind of the highest category, then you need to have this kind of a third party or an external company or an entity coming and then verifying that you are secure. So if you are in the category two, then you just need to do it yourself. You don't need this uh, 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 external party to come and verify it for you. And then there is this kind of a third category where which I mean, which doesn't require any of these things, but they still require to have some certain level of basic uh, cybersecurity things in place. And then we have two uh, uh, sister regulations here. One is this machine regulation, the other is radio equipment directive. Machine regulation deals with uh, all the uh, machinery, basically. So it, it has this kind of a health and safety requirements as well, but then there is a cybersecurity section there, which uh, mentions that how, that how these machines should be cyber secure. And the same is the case with the radio equipment directive. It deals with anything that is uh, uh, using this, 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 this wireless technology. So it could be Wi-Fi or radio controllers, Bluetooth, uh, GPS, and all of these kind of devices are being covered by the radio equipment directive, RED, and similar to the machine regulation, it has a section for uh, the security. So it covers other topics as well. And then uh, very quickly coming on the standard side of the things, uh, there can be other standards that can, that, that are also applicable on uh, uh, operational technology. But if you think about, uh, so let me explain this to you. So there are this two, two, two kind of regulations and standards. So there is kind of horizontal, uh, 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 standards or regulations, which means that they are quite general and they can be applied to many different fields. For example, they can also apply to, for example, food manufacturing and then uh, power generation and, uh, for example, steel mills or car manufacturers. So they are quite general. So these two are the horizontal uh, standards. But then there are uh, some uh, industry-specific standards. For example, if you go for the uh, financial industry, so there the requirements are tougher. So they have their own set of uh, standards, including the security ones. And similarly, if you go to, for example, food processing, so they will have their own. For example, if you go for the car manufacturer or vehicles, they have their own vertical set of standards. So, so there are just kind of vertical standards and there is kind of horizontal standards. So ISO 27001 and 62443 are horizontal standards and they can apply to a wide variety of uh, industries and ISO 27001, you can say that it is it matches to NIST two, so it's on the organization level. While IEC 62443 can 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 be quite similar to uh, the other three, so because it talks about the uh, OT security and industrial uh, security very specifically, and then and then it 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 it, it makes this. Uh, it talks about IEC 62443 is actually a very comprehensive set of standards. And uh, there are multiple layers of it that I will just show you after this. And then it covers that not only from the uh, how the industrial product should be securely developed, but it also lays, do lays down the list of security requirements, not only for the component level, but also on the system level. And also it also defines that how uh, these industrial equipments uh, uh, and the and the OT side of the things should be securely uh, operated and securely maintained. So it's, it's it's a really comprehensive set of standards and could be overwhelming uh, to begin with. But uh, if you uh, dig a bit deeper, then you start realizing the efficiency and the uh, this the whole spectrum that it actually covers. Yeah. So it's more. Uh, organized like a kind of an onion kind of a thing. So first of all, there is a general level which discusses the general, uh, for example, the terminologies and the basic methodologies. And then we come to the policies and procedure part of it. So like how the things 
should be done in a secure way from a policy level or, or on a management level. And then the third level comes in where we talk about the system as a whole. For example, like uh, uh, you think about a factory as a whole or you think about a whole manufacturing unit as a whole. How can I make it secure? And all the requirements are covered by this third level. And then it comes, it, it, it drills down to the component level at the end. So, for example, like if uh, there's a manufacturing unit, then maybe maybe 100 components there, then what should be the uh, um, security requirement for each of them? Yeah. And then, uh, so this is how it looks like, IEC 62443. And I'm emphasizing on this uh, family of standards because it's uh, most widely used uh, standard. Uh, from the um, OT point of view, and as you can see uh, from the from this page as well, there, there are four different layers of it, and each uh, layer have multiple standards uh, that cover different aspects of it. And if you ask me from the product security point of view, so I will be most more, mostly interested in these three standards. So uh, on the system level, uh, this 3-3, it covers the system security requirements and the security levels, and it lays down how we should make our system secure. And then uh, comes this uh, level four. The four dash one says that how the development cycle should be made secure. And then four dash two actually is kind of, you can say uh, the component level for this three dash three, and it defines that for each component, what should be the security requirements. So IC6243 IC is a really comprehensive set of standards and it covers all the, all the basis for the industrial security. And then uh, in a similar way, it defines uh, uh, different security levels. So uh, if your system doesn't have any security bigger than it SL0, which is usually the case when we start. And, and if you have uh, some very basic protection there that can that, that can save you against, for example, uh, uh, amateur attacks, then it's SL1. But then, we, when, then things start to get really serious when we get to SL2. Then we start to look into the uh, the processes and the security controls are in place. So then we get to SL2, but then we, and we then SL3 and SL4 are, are, are really sophisticated. And maybe SL4, you can say, is a military grade uh, level where you really need to uh, fix uh, a lot of things there. So there is, uh, uh, as you increase the security level here, so the number of requirements for each level keeps on increasing. And as, as, and as I said that uh, if I think about these different security levels, so it depends upon how are you interpreting your 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 requirements and what kind of uh, uh, industry or what kind of system you are looking into it. But usually the case is that if you have SL2, so then it's quite acceptable. And if you get SL3, for example, then I think from SL2 to SL3 is a very sharp uh, it's, it's a very sharp curve there. So it's you need a lot of effort from SL2 to SL3 to jump to SL3 there. But usually for normal system, SL2 should be enough in most of the cases. Yeah. Then uh, uh, just thinking about what kind of uh, uh, very specific challenges the OT security has. So usually the case is that we mostly think and hear about the IT side of the things. But when we think about the OT side of the things, what are those specific things that we don't see on the IT side of the things. So I have listed six of them here. So let's start with this, the first one. The first one is the the legacy system. So usually what happens is, is happened is that, uh, I mean, the life cycle of the OT system is really long. So it could be 10 years, it could be 20 years. For example, let's imagine, for example, a crane and, uh, and, and, and a hydropower, hydroelectric power dam. So for example, when you create those dams, so they are there for maybe 40 years or 30 years, or maybe even 50 years. So when they create the dam, they already put the crane there over the generators. So that crane will be will be in operation for the next 40 years, basically. So this means that uh, uh, like in there, there will be some cranes there that will be there from 1980 or maybe 1975. And the systems at that time were uh, totally different from what we have right now. So there is this uh, issue of that, that many of those OT systems are legacy systems and those security features are not built in at that time. And now with the uh, modernization and uh, and also, I mean, the new emerging requirements, so then they, there is a significant uh, uh, issue in, for example, how do you upgrade those systems or patch those systems, basically. 
And then we have this IoT and OT convergence, which means that just imagine that a factory. So, uh, uh, for example, in, in a factory, we have these, these machines working that you are looking at, at the screen. And now with the industry uh, uh, 4.0, industrial IoT, so these machines have started to talk with each other. And this means that they already have their own OT network going on. And then uh, usually uh, the companies have their own enterprise network as well. So, 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 so the thing is that uh, this IT and OT uh, uh, networks are usually they are connecting at some point or some place they are connecting to each other, which means that since our enterprise network is already visible to the internet, so there is a possibility that if an intruder gets into your IT network, then they, it, it, then they can actually make their way to your OT network. So this means that IT OT network convergence is happening and which is actually necessary in many cases, but then there should be this kind of a network segmentation and kind of a proper things in place in order to avoid uh, the incidents uh, from, from, from the malicious actors and the hackers. And then we have the physical security here as well, because uh, uh, usually these kind of machines are uh, in, in a place where the people are physically working in, in the close proximity to it. So there is also a huge emphasis on physical security here that, uh, that, that the, for example, the gates or this, uh, uh, the access to the facility should be properly guarded because if somebody has, is able to reach the machine itself and then they know how to actually manipulate it, then it's a, a, a very high security risk there. And then uh, the other thing is limited visibility. So usually uh, the factories are in uh, are not as accessible as, as our IT and cloud systems like online, and they usually operate in this kind of isolated network and sometimes also physically isolated, for example, in a separate zones. And this makes it really difficult to uh, uh, monitor OT systems and identify the threats there. And then uh, just like that legacy system uh, issue that I, I mentioned, so uh, the, the, the similar case is with the, uh, in, uh, the people who are working there on, on the plants on, on the OT security side of the things. So usually they are engineers and they are the control system guys, and they are not very good on the, on the cyber security side of the things. And this is also an issue. That's why the awareness and the training part is really important. And especially, for example, if we are upgrading our system, upgrading our factories or, or putting in new features, so then it's really important then uh, the, the persons or the, or the experts that are, uh, are physically working on the machines or they are actually taking care of the factories or, or plants, they must be properly trained before that feature is switched on. And the very specific design there. Uh, uh, so usually the OT systems are, for example, designed for a very specific purpose. For example, the picture here, the above picture is for a power plant or or, um, or something like that. And then the lower picture is about a chemical plant. So each application has its very specific design, which is to, can be totally different from, from the other facilities. So this means, so this actually also adds a dimension of complexity into how we make uh, the, 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 our, our OT systems more secure. And then uh, in, in the end, I would like to mention some uh, uh, prominent uh, uh, cybersecurity incidents from the o OT side of the thing. So there was this colonial pipeline uh, attack in, in USA a few years back. And there, uh, the attackers were, the hackers were actually able to uh, um, take control of the pipeline. And then I think they used this ransomware. And then uh, they have to pay this 4.4 million in uh, to to get the the system back online just imagine that how uh, important uh, this kind of a pipeline is whether it's a gas pipeline or or a, or a oil pipeline or or a, or a water pipeline so the whole uh, communities depend on that and then the availability of this system is of paramount importance and then we had this uh, very uh, uh, highly sophisticated solar winds attack that that happens uh, some time ago, and it also reached not only IT systems but some OT systems that were also affected or, or by that. And then uh, recently, uh, uh, there is this kind of a Russian cyber attack on the Ukrainian power grid, and it it has been happening more and more going forward. Then we have in 2016 we had this uh, attack on the French rail system, and then uh, there is this uh, specific uh, attacks on the, the the power grids 
using this uh, Havex malware that happened in 20, 2014, basically. So these are a few examples of uh, um, uh, cybersecurity incidents. And as you can see that they most of them are actually targeted to critical infrastructure like oil or the rail systems or the power grid or the factories that can actually cripple the whole communities or even the whole cities in, in, in a way. Or in case of Ukraine, it can just cripple the whole country. Yeah. So thank you very much. Uh, that's all from my side. So just to end uh, that, uh, uh, again, on the same note that uh, with the digit with the digitalization and this industry revolution and the more and more for example now all this uh, new ai use cases are coming that can you can even never thought of for example self correcting machines and advanced quality controls and then with for example this uh, iot the machines are talking with uh, with each other seamlessly and then uh, making the process is more and more uh, sophisticated as well as more efficient basically but then on the other side of the things the threat surface uh, area has really increased. We are getting uh, AI-based attacks now and uh, ransomware, uh, more complicated forms of, the, for example, uh, uh, DOS attacks and all of these things are happening. So game is up on the both sides. And uh, uh, also from the uh, uh, career point of view, OT cybersecurity is an emerging field. And there is there is a lot of room of improvement still on in, in on the OT side of the things from the cybersecurity point of view, and also a lot of uh, more talent is needed in order to cover up uh, the shortage of resources that we are we are now facing. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks, Faisal. Uh, thanks for the valuable presentations, and this is good for all of us. Uh, in the meanwhile, yeah, I would like to yeah mention about that. Uh, all of the audience can ask questions through the uh, mentee.com. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, please try to uh, ask question, and this is a good time to uh, ask question to PySets related to the OD security. Uh, right now, I receive uh, several questions. And yeah, in the meanwhile, I would like to introduce about the uh, our network security course walk. Uh, so yeah, you can uh, study more detail about the uh, what is the uh, cyber security, how can we attack, and how can we protect the system in more detail. So yeah, please try to submit your question to the meti.com. In the meanwhile, yeah, I would like to introduce the our course walk. Uh, yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah. In here, yeah, we would like to introduce about the our our applying network security course walk. So, if you are interested more detail about the network security course walk, uh, you can yeah uh, apply uh, from the uh www.mune.se slash drive So yeah, this course walk was set on Thursday and yeah, it is a good time to apply to study more detail about the uh, network security, uh, especially uh, different type of attack, how can we prevent uh, in the, and also you can do the a kind of the project related to the uh, network security related things by using the yeah, real tools. So yeah, this is a good time to join our apply network security course walk. So yeah, now I have several questions. So yeah, uh, by said, are you ready to answer the question from the audience? Yeah. Ah, yes. Uh, now, the first question is that uh, how has OT and product security 
been affected by the current war situation? Uh, which 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 situation? Sorry. Uh, like, uh, how has the OT and product security been affected by the current war situation? Current uh, trend, something like that. Yeah. So, uh, so for, uh, for first of all, I think uh, as I mentioned that. Uh, uh, especially on the OT side of the things, what was happening previously is that that they were in working in silos. So the machines were not connected to each other and they were not talking to each other. And then people were manually operating them. And even if there is a robotic process, it's quite local, but now they we have interconnected connect, connected machines and they're talking with each other and they are uh, uh, also sending the data back, for example, to the cloud for more processing. So this means that the whole scenario has changed basically. So we have to now start thinking of, for example, uh, for example, if, this, if, if, our, if our factories are sending data back to, for example, some cloud or some data lake, so there should be this kind of a unidirectional gateway so that the data can flow only from one side, of, uh, one side, not on the other side of the things. So that, for example, if somebody gets hold of, for example, your cloud system, they should not be able to actually send back those malicious instructions back to the machines that can self-destruct or, or, or harm the people who are working there. And also from the product security side of the thing, this means that when we are just started to design uh, uh, for example, uh, these OT systems or or, or these, uh, uh, for example, the controllers that are actually controlling uh, the, the machines, then we already need to think about now that now they can be accessed from, from outside and then there should be security features there, proper authentication and authorization there so that uh, only those people who are supposed to actually work on the system get the access. Uh, thank you for the uh, answer. Another question is that, how is AI changing the cybersecurity domain? Yeah, that's a really good question. Actually, it's it's actually li like any other field. It's actually transforming how, how we are doing things now. And uh, uh, I would say that, uh, uh, that uh, like not only from the resources point of view, but also from the tools point of view. And then also, as I said, also that uh, from this, from this cyber threats point of view, everything is totally transforming now. So for example, like if you, uh, for example, with this LLMs, uh, all the way, if you use, for example, chat GPT or perplexity or Gemini for, from Google, if you ask them to write kind of uh, uh, a script to hack a system, they will not write it for you. But if you go to, for example, deep web there, you, you can find some of the LLMs that can do it for you. This means that the bar of uh, having, the bar of being able to significantly attack a system has really lowered. So previously what was happening that before before this AI, that uh, if, you re if you want to, significantly harm a system, then you should not only you should have the technical capabilities, uh, but you also should know the system, the how does it work, and then you combine everything together and then you can make it work. But now with this, these, this, this LLMs, this thing, at, at least for example, for, for example, from the uh, uh, writing the scripts point of view, th this thing has really become so easy. And this means that the, the number of attacks we are getting has, has really increased. So, if you see on the other side of the things, if you look at the 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 companies or the or the vendors that are creating those security tools, they have already started to incorporate AI on their side as well. So now it's AI versus AI, AI going on uh, at, at at the moment. And also uh, one more aspect is that uh, if you think about uh, uh, different roles within the product security, then how the AI will actually impact them that will also be quite quite profound. So for example, like uh, now with this uh, co-pilot and other AI tools, uh, uh, the the role definition will definitely change within coming years. That uh, for example, if I take if I take up a security analyst or or uh, I, I take a product security expert, then I will be expecting different uh, uh, I mean, capabilities from them going going forward. Uh, thank, thanks for the answer. And also, yeah, we have several questions. More like uh, currently, yeah, there is the EU uh, AI Act. So, yeah, mm. based on that one, yeah, in future, yeah, what will happen in the yeah, implementation of AI in the this kind of security-related products? 
that's yes, another very very good question so uh I, I mean first of all if you think about this ai act it's the first time in the world that any nation or any authority or any entity has created this 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 kind of uh, regulation so i would say that it's still to be seen how will it affect in 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 specifically different fields uh but from if we think about the product security point of view uh what what i can see is that uh, just like uh we have this uh for example cyber security act or GD gdpr that came and they started to actually force the vendors as as well as the op operators to take up those security measures because first initially it, it is not mandatory for them but with this kind of regulation it's mandatory for them so they have to start investing and thinking about the security and with this ai act the same thing will happen on the ai side of the things although uh you you can argue that like in 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 the current context of things if you are not using ai you will just f fall behind but then with this ai act I, uh, there will be some specific things that you that everybody needs to take into account from all the different stages of their life cycle of their products yeah so to to, to just to summarize i think it still needs to be seen how will it affect but definitely uh, uh, now uh, there is more motivation for everybody to use ai into their uh, not only development, operations, maintenance, and sales, and, and all the different processes. Yeah. Uh, thank you for the answer. Another question is like, uh, when can we say our products is a kind of the GDPR compliance, something like that? So when can we say yeah, those kind of things? Uh, actually, it has all already started to happen now with, with, with many companies. But I would say that, for example, this the uh, for example the Cyber Resil Resilience Act has this deadline of I think uh, one or one 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 year or two years. I don't know exactly the the duration, but but within a couple of years, uh, anybody which is selling uh, their products with a digital element in EU must comply with the Cyber Resilience Act. So so I would say within a couple of years we will start um, look. Uh, Having this uh, visibility that the companies and the and the product manufacturers have start to comply with those, and the other thing with CRA is that it's, it does not only apply to things that are manufactured in EU, but for example, if you're importing something from Asia or USA or Africa, so whoever is importing that product uh, within EU is responsible that that product complies with the CRA uh, recommendations or, or or requirements. So I would say uh, the short answer would be within a couple of years. Yeah. Thank you for your great answer. So yeah, we have yeah eight more minutes left. So uh, if you have more question, please uh, ask question through the Mentimeter. And yeah, meanwhile, yeah, I would like to introduce again our network cybersecurity course work again. So yeah, if you are interested in those AI cybersecurity related topics, yeah, please try to our apply network security coursework. So in here, yeah, this is the course information. And yeah, you can apply through the www.mijun.se.se slash driving. Yeah, and T2020 uh it was set in uh, Thursday, and it will take around 10 week course walk and it's a three credit course walk. So, yeah, let me meet again in the uh, Apply Network Security course walk, and yeah, we can study more detail about the cyber security and yeah, what can we do and how can we protect and how can we attack and how can we implement the different kind of algorithm in the your, your like a current company your, and also you maybe understand uh, how can we use AI related tools in the uh, cyber security related things like uh, intrusion detection system. So yeah. For the final question, so yeah, for the like uh, if 
the student want to work in like uh, OT cybersecurity uh, related uh, job in this case, what is your recommendation? What kind of course work yeah, they need to study and yeah, what kind of thing they need to know? Uh, so so to, to, to start a career in OT cybersecurity, I would say that uh, I think a good beginning would be to look into the what IEC 62443 is, that, that standard that I introduced today. That could be a good good beginning uh, to start from there, and then look, looking into the kind of the requirements there, and then and then uh, and then applying for 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 kind of a similar position within some industry, basically. So I think IEC six two four four three is is a good uh, starting point. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for your great contributions to our network class. Thank you. Yeah, so th thank you very much for, for having me and it, it's been really, really uh, uh, a privilege to be here. Thank you very much. <laughs> yes, thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you for joining our open guest lecture session, session uh, for the product security for uh, operation and technology OT, and yeah, if you are interested more about yeah this kind of security related things, I recommend you to join the our apply network uh, course walk, and yeah you can study more or we can learn together about more detail in the uh, network security related tools and algorithms, and also how can we use AI related tools for the security related things. So yeah, we can meet again in the yeah, Apply Network Security course walk. See you very soon.